morning everyone today we are going to talk about the city features of esophageal emergencies the spectrum of esophageal emergencies includes esophagitis foreign body impaction and traumatic esophageal injury the problem is that most of these findings have a non-specific manifestations so this will result in an extremely importance extreme importance of the CT scan in the detection the diagnosis and the differentiation between these different pathological processes in addition it will help to, the CT scan will help to localize the extent of the disease assess complications exclude alternative diagnoses let's start with esophagitis esophagitis is a common disease it's inflammation of the esophagus it it has many causes like caustic ingestion, radiation, medication, infection, whatever the cause, the barium swallow and endoscopy are the main uh, procedures for the diagnosis and the evaluation of the esophagitis, while the CT scan, whatever the cause, will result in non specific findings. So, CT scan is less beneficial in, in cases of esophagitis in comparison to endoscopy or a barium swallow. Usually, it's done when it's, uh, the diagnosis is unclear or where uh, a complication is suspected. What are the findings on the CT scan? The findings include thickening of the esophageal wall more than 5 mm, target sign with hypoattenuating thickened wall, that's to say edematous wall, also, uh, uh, also high attenuation enhancing mucosa because the mucosa is inflamed, it will show post-contrast enhancement, while the wall is edematous, so it will appear as hypoattenuating thick wall. For example, you can see here, this is uh, esophagus, of a patient suffering from esophagitis post chemotherapy showing markedly thickened wall and thick enhancing mucosa as a result of inflammation another case of esophagitis you can see the marked wall thickening and mucosal enhancement or uh, increased attenuation one of the most common esophageal emergencies is foreign body impaction most of the ingested objects usually pass spontaneously without the need for any intervention. However, between 10 to 20 percent of the ingested foreign bodies, including those that are retained within the esophagus, will require endoscopic removal and surgery is needed in only about 1 percent of the cases. Foreign body ingestion is most commonly seen in children, in people with psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia, bulimia, things like that, and in prisoners as they usually might try to get admitted to the hospital in order to try to escape prison. In children, coins are frequently ingested for foreign bodies, while in adults, food bolluses, often meat, and especially camel meat, uh, is uh, a frequent uh, cause of foreign body impaction. Bones from fish, from chickens, are the second most common foreign body in both pediatric and adult population and are more likely to become lodged in the hypopharynx or the cervical esophagus. The problem is that in the hypopharynx or cervical esophagus, endoscopy is difficult to visualize these uh, bones. So CT will be especially useful in these cases. The thin esophageal wall, the lack of supporting adventitia, and the relatively poor blood supply make the esophagus vulnerable to perforation. Pressure necrosis from foreign bodies that become lodged in it because of the low blood supply the the if it's the foreign body is chronically lodged it will result in might result in perforation and due to pressure necrosis so barium studies as are discouraged because first if there is a perforation barium will leak into the surrounding structure which will result in severe granulomatous reaction uh, the second cause is that barium will coat the esophageal mucosa it will makes the subsequent attempt of endoscopic examination and retrieval of the foreign body useless and very difficult so avoid barium studies CT may be useful in selected cases when a more definitive diagnosis or localization is desired before endoscopic intervention or when the perforation or other complications is suspected chronic impaction of a foreign body in the esophagus may produce erosion, fistula formation, inflammatory action that are indistinguishable from those produced by a neoplastic process that's why you might Diagnosis uh, someone with esophageal carcinoma, and uh, after after further workup, it will uh, uh, appear uh, as uh, 
chronic impaction of a foreign body resulting in inflammatory reaction forming a mass like lesion which looks very similar to esophageal carcinoma so be careful in this uh, aspect for example you can see here it's foreign body impaction in the esophagus of a teenager with down syndrome there is something in the esophagus here within the lumen it contains multiple air bubbles it has contrast material retained within it oral contrast retained within this so uh, after uh, form uh, in barium swallow appears as a filling defect within the lumen of the esophagus and there are no signs of perforation or leak so this was uh, after endoscoping uh, endoscopic retrieval was a part of a vinyl glove because the patient is mentally retarded it's a case of down syndrome this is a middle-aged woman with dysphagia uh, after eating fried chicken the lateral cervical x-ray shows a bone within the hypopharynx and on the CT scan the bone is clearly seen on the left side of the laryngopharynx this is an elderly woman of 90 years old was diagnosed previously with, with esophageal carcinoma and the esophagography shows a complete obstruction of the esophagus near the level of the carina here with no passage of contrast distally and on CT scan there appears to be a mass like lesion which corresponds with the esophageal carcinoma diagnosis and this mass appears to root into the posterior wall of the left main bronchus however Upon endoscopy, there was a blister pack, uh, a cover of uh, a pill, chronically impacted at the esophagus, resulting in inflammation and mass like lesion, which is very similar to esophageal carcinoma. And there was no esophageal carcinoma, just inflammatory pseudotumor, which is completely resolved after removal of the impacted foreign body. Regarding trauma of the esophagus, traumatic injury to the esophagus results from both extraluminal and intraluminal processes. Injuries that are proved to be extraluminal, blunt or penetrating trauma usually involves the cervical and upper thoracic esophagus. However, injury of the esophagus at the cervical or upper thoracic parts is relatively rare because of its small size and its relatively protected position the trachea anterior to it and the vertebral bodies posterior to it so there should be like a massive trauma in order for the esophag esophagus to be injured at these areas however intraluminal processes are much more common as a cause of trauma to the esophagus for example instrumentation uh, endoscopies foreign body impaction elusive esophagitis and other pathological processes may give rise to a spectrum of injuries to the esophagus which range from mild to moderate to severe at the mild end there are injuries such as mucosal laceration more severe is intramural dissection and hematoma and at the other end transmural perforation can be catastrophic uh, injury to the esophagus mucosal laceration and most intramural perforations and some cervical and contained perforations of the esophagus might be managed conservatively however intrathoracic perforation generally considered a surgical emergency when esophageal injury is suspected the imaging evaluation should generally commence with a swallow while the patient uses water soluble contrast material don't use barium because when you have esophageal injury you might have perforation perforation result in leak of barium will result in marked granulomatous reaction so use water soluble contrast material in patients with penetrating trauma to the neck or chest, CT should be performed before the contrast study, the contrast swallow. Why? Because the contrast will uh, make the CT less informative. So start with the CT scan, then go to the barrio, to the sorry water soluble contrast study. CT may be useful in patients who are too ill to cooperate in esophagography or swallow studies, or as a complementary exam to the contrast enhanced luminal studies to further delineate the extent of the disease assessment of complications and as a guide for therapy in patients with acute chest pain the differential diagnosis in addition to esophageal trauma might include aortic dissection and pulmonary embolism and certainly CT scan here will be of marked importance so what are the CT findings of esophageal injury these are esophageal wall thickening peri-esophageal gas and fluid collection
contrast material extravasation, mediastinal fluid collection, mediastinal inflammation, focal esophageal wall defect, and pleural effusion. These are the main findings in esophageal injury. We're going to have a little talk about the malory waste tear and other mucosal lacerations. The malory waste tear is a longitudinal mucosal laceration observed in the distal esophagus or across the gastroesophageal junction. Its pathogenesis is similar to that of Borhev syndrome. Both occur in the setting of retching, vomiting, frequently after excessive alcohol consumption, and may occur as a complication of endoscopy. Similar linear mucosal laceration occur elsewhere in the esophagus as a result of forceful swallowing of an impacted foreign body or food bolus. Mucosal laceration without transmural perforation, usually radiographically occult. You will not see anything by radiology. For example, in this case, middle-aged woman with chest pain after forcefully swallowing a bite of sandwich lodged in her throat on the axial CT, you can see there are air bubbles on both sides. Okay, and this is an extra luminal air bubble, and this is the esophagus proper. Okay, so this indicates a contained perforation. There is no other air bubbles surrounding the esophagus, and no signs of uh, non-contained perforation. So this is just a contained perforation of the esophagus. Another uh, barium esophagogram uh, in less than 24 hours detect only linear barium filling de uh, defect you can see here this is a filling defect this is the mucosal line indicating mucosal laceration intramural dissection and hematoma collectively referred to as submucosal dissection intramural rupture intramural dissection intramural hematoma it's a collective names Symptoms include abrupt onset retrosternal chest pain, dysphagia, odinophagia, hematemesis. Most patients experience at least two of the three. Hematemesis generally occur later in the clinical course. History of recent instrumentation is probably the most important risk factor. Other contributing events are foreign body impaction, forceful vomiting. Spontaneous intramural hematoma of the esophagus occurs in patients who are undergoing anticoagulant drug therapy or who have inherent coagulopathy just spontaneously without any previous injury or trauma or any previous history intramural hematoma occurs usually there is either inherent coagulopathy or anticoagulant drug therapy so the CT findings of dissection correlates with those seen at esophagography Mu submucosal distribution of the gas or contrast material giving the esophagus a characteristic double barrel appearance Dissection tends to occur posterior to the true lumen, and its full extent may be best appreciated on sagittal or coronal reformatted images. For example, you can see here, there is a mucosal line, and there is marked, uh, obviously seen as a case of dissection, and you can see the double uh, barrel appearance. So this is an intramural dissection of the esophagus. On the CT scan, you can see this is the true lumen of the esophagus, while contrast appears to be contained here, right posterior. So, again, it's posterior to the esophagus. Most of the esophageal perforations occur posteriorly, from the posterior wall. So, uh, this indicates a contained perforation. You can see this, uh, the contrast is contained. Again, you can see here, these are like it appears like there are double esophagus, double barrel appearance indicating intramural dissection. However, one of the lumens contains an NG tube, which marks that this is the true lumen and this is the false lumen. On the coronal reformatted images, you can see the NG tube guide you to the true lumen and the false lumen. Can you you can differentiate? This uh, CT scan without uh, oral contrast, and you can see this is the true lumen again. The air is seen posteriorly so this is a dissection of the esophagus and, and the coronal reformatted images you can see that the dissection is a full length of the esophagus from the gastroesophageal junction into the upper uh, cervical esophagus what about intramural hematoma intramural hematoma 
The diagnosis might be challenging because the esophageal symptoms may mimic those of acute MI, aortic dissection, so CT will be invaluable to differentiate. At the CT scan, the intramural hematoma will appear as eccentric, hyperattenuating mass within the wall of the esophagus, and the distinction is integral to proper treatment because anticoagulation is understandably contraindicated in the presence of intramural hematoma of the esophagus. With conservative management, intramural esophageal dissection and hematoma are expected to result within a few days or weeks. So, if a patient has an intramural hematoma and you mix it up or the, the differential diagnosis might include pulmonary embolism, the treatment for pulmonary embolism includes uh, anticoagulation, anticoagulant therapy, which is absolutely contraindicated in intramural hematoma because it will increase the bleeding. So, CT will be invaluable in differentiating. It is, is this an aortic dissection, pulmonary embolism, or intramural hematoma because the treatment will be completely and totally different between the three conditions. For example, you can see uh, there is an intramural esophageal hematoma after transesophageal echocardiography. This is the true lumen of the esophagus. And you can see here there is a complex cystic mass within the posterior wall of the esophagus, causing mass effect on the esophagus and the trachea, uh, pushing them anteriorly. And within the mass, you can see here there is a fluid debris level. And again, another one here, like a hematocrit level. This one, and this is the fluid. So indicating blood with sedimentation of the blood products. We said previously that usually intramural hematoma will resolve within a few days or weeks. However, this one was a large hematoma and it required surgical intervention, surgical drainage. What about transmural perforation, the most catastrophic event? Transmural perforation may occur in a variety of settings. Clinical presentation and CT appearance are similarly valuable. Depending on the mechanism of the injury, the site, the size of the perforation, and the time elapsed since the onset of the symptoms. Iatrogenic perforation of the esophagus is increasingly common. Therapeutic endoscopic procedures like stricture dilatation, stent placement being the leading causes also can occur as a complication of surgical procedures like gastric fundoplication, thyroidectomy, and anterior cervical discectomy. Chest X-ray will show pneumomediastinum, subcutaneous air, mediastinal widening, mediastinal air fluid level, pleural effusion, pneumothorax, pericardium, pneumo, uh, and or hydropneumothorax. The site of perforation can be suggested by the plain radiographic find. You can look at the X-ray and you can suggest this is an upper esophageal injury, middle esophageal injury, or lower esophageal injury. If the perforation was at the lower esophagus, at the gastroesophageal junction, usually will result in left-sided pleural effusion or hydropneumothorax, while if the perforation at the mid-esophagus, it will cause, tend to cause right-sided pleural effusion or hydropneumothorax. If it was at the upper part of the esophagus at the cervical part, it will re usually result in subcutaneous surgical emphysema and uh, crepitus. One thing we should mention here, and we should be careful to look for it, is the V sign of Naclerio. It is an early plain radiographic finding seen in spontaneous rupture of the esophagus. Usually evident before physical signs are present, and it represents localized mediastinal emphysema due to air uh, collecting between the uh, uh, forming the letter V between the facial planes of the mediastina and the and the left diaphragmatic pleura. We will see an example of it in, uh, in a while. The distal left posterior wall is the most common site of spontaneous rupture, which is classically result in pneumomediastinum and left pleural effusion. Patients with cervical esophageal perforation, like we said, typically present with crepitus, neck pain, instead of chest or epigastric pain. Perforation of the cervical esophagus should be considered in the presence of cervical subcutaneous emphysema or uh, the anterior wall of the esophagus, a complication of superior mediastinal fluid collection. So, if it was in the anterior wall, there will be superior mediastinal fluid collection. For example, you can see here, this is what we call the B-sign of Neclerio. It appears as the letter V between the descending thoracic aorta, the mediastinal pleura, and the left diaphragmatic pleura. You can see it also here, the left diaphragm and the descending thoracic aorta. This is a very early sign of esophageal perforation. This condition 
uh, this is a condition of delayed esophageal rupture. The initial chest X-ray shows intact left hemidiaphragm. Here you can see it, completely intact. However, there is widened mediastinum. This promoted the further evaluation by CT scan. And when we did the CT scan, there will there was no vascular injury, but it still esophagus is thick, large, and asymmetric. And there was evidence of herniation of part of the stomach. Okay. So, uh, swallow study was performed with a non-ionic contrast material and demonstrated that there is a distal esophageal rupture here and herniation of the stomach through a widened uh, esophageal hiatus. This happened after uh, attempt to dilate a lower esophageal stricture. There was a stricture at the lower esophagus, dilatation done resulting in rupture of the esophagus with contrast leak and there was also a paraesophageal gastric hernia. Again, a case of iatrogenic perforation in a middle-aged woman after bilundic dilatation of a distal esophageal structure. There was a distal esophageal structure here. This is an anti-reflux device was inserted after the dilatation and when you go at a lower level, you can see there, is, there are multiple air bubbles extra luminal in location result, uh, indicating a rupture of the distal esophagus at the gastroesophageal junction. Again, you can see here the atrogenic esophageal perforation after esophageal stent placement. There was a narrowing of the esophagus after radiotherapy for lung carcinoma. So they tried to insert stents to dilate the esophagus and you can see there are two stents inserted. This is one and this is one. And you can see that at the water soluble uh, contrast to swallow, the leak is mainly at the site of the junction between the two stents here and here. On the CT scan, this is the stent dilating the esophagus and you can see multiple air fluid level, uh, sorry, multiple gas bubbles extra luminal in location. This is a case of two cases of Borhef syndrome in two late middle aged men. The axial contrast enhanced CT scan, you can see there is evidence of perforation of the, esophagus, of the esophagus at this part and marked contrast leak at the uh, paraesophageal on the right uh, on the left side and left-sided pleural effusion indicating a lower esophageal rupture or tear okay of course there is a pleural effusion on the right side however it's relatively mild compared to the left side again you can see here evidence of contrast leak this is the esophagus the esophageal lumen and there is an extra luminal contrast so this extra luminal contrast indicates a leak from the esophagus surgery was done and a rupture or tear was proven Again, you can see here, this is a case of schizophrenia patient and with bulimia. Uh, there is evidence of contrast leak from the posterior wall of the hypopharynx. Upper esophagus contained contrast leak. And if you notice, there are marked amount, there is a large amount of subcutaneous emphysema resulting in crepitus between the soft tissues of the neck here and here and here and on swallow studies there is obviously a contrast leak from the esophagus at this part what are the complications of the esophageal emergencies most of the mortality associated with esophageal emergency has been attributed to delay in the diagnosis and the treatment whatever the cause perforation is a common point of origin for a number of potentially life-threatening complications like mediastinitis, pneumonia, empyemia, lung abscess, and uh, they are among the most commonly seen complications. Tissue destruction due to mediastinal inflammation, infection, or both may result in development of fistula between the esophagus and the adjacent structures, including the tra tracheobronchial tree, stomach, and very rarely the aorta. For example, you can see here in pyema, a middle-aged woman with a delayed presentation and treatment after spontaneous esophageal rupture. There is a gas containing empyema in the 
right side in the right hemithorax you can see there is a gas multiple there are multiple air bubbles within the, this fluid collection indicating empyema as a result of delayed treatment of esophageal rupture the esophagus here is thick and inflamed as a result of the rupture again this is a case of lung abscess in a middle-aged woman with a previous diagnosis of squamous cell cancer of the esophagus this is the esophagus it's thick due to uh, carc uh, carcinog uh, due to the esophageal carcinoma and you can see here there is a thick wall collection containing multiple air bubbles and fluid indicating empyema as a result of perforation of the gastric carcinoma forming uh, an abscess this is a case uh, there are, these are two different cases of aerodigestive fistula uh, this was a patient with esophageal carcinoma and you can see clearly that the esophageal tumor has eroded into the posterior wall of the left main bronchus while this is a case of patients with AIDS infection uh, HIV uh, resulting uh, associated with severe candidiasis of the esophagus and this result in spontaneous fistula formation between the esophagus which appears here widely patent and patulous and the adjacent trachea, resulting in tracheoesophageal fistula. This is a case of esophagogastric fistula in patients with persistent pain after gastric fund duplication. As a treatment of gastroesophageal reflux, you can see here this is the stomach containing some air, while this is a, an extra luminal air here collected and tracking up to the level of the gastroesophageal junction. On water soluble contrast evaluation, you can see here this is the gastroesophageal junction with the contrast passing under the stomach, and there is a whole fistula tract seen from the lower part of the esophagus at the gastroesophageal junction and tracking along the greater curvature of the stomach to open into the stomach. And this was a gastroesophageal uh, gastric fistula uh, secondary to gastric fund duplication, complicated by esophageal perforation. Thank you very much and hope to see you next week.